Good morning. Welcome here to uh, LACF on a beautiful Sunday morning. Um, I'd like to welcome our guest preacher today, Pat Ryszewski from Bethlehem, and of course welcome you here to Lakes Area. Our mission is uh, to uh, share the love of Christ and transform lives by teaching the word, serving others, and fostering fellowship in, uh, in Christ. Uh, here at LACF, we always like to start with something a little lighthearted. Uh, there was a three-year-old boy and his mom, and they always made a big deal out of making a cake together. And she had a little stool she'd bring out for him, and they finished the cake one morning and just finished it, and uh, the doorbell rang. So the mom grabbed the little three-year-old, they went to the door, and she was visiting and thought everybody was standing right there, meeting the, the, the little son. So she went, didn't see him and went back to the kitchen and um, the three-year-old had his face covered in frosting. And the mom leaned over and said, were you eating cake? And he goes, no, mommy, I just kissed it. Some announcements today, uh, Anchored Youth, the Zoom meeting is uh, this evening, um, Sunday from 6 to 8. Uh, please mark your calendars because next Sunday we have Pastor uh, Mark and Lynette Schultz will be here. And Pastor Mark is from Peace Lutheran in Eau Claire, and we have called him to be our, our next pastor. Um, not only joining us for service, but he'll be, he and his wife are here for Q&A after the service to take your questions, have some fellowship time and visit with you. So make sure you mark your calendar that you can stay with us uh, and visit with Pastor uh, Mark and Lynette. Um, Life Worth Living, the Philippians Bible Study, uh, the men are skipping this week. Uh, Co-ed will be at six o'clock in the gathering space. Oh, you're out, okay, not. <laughs> Um, rosters are available at the information table back there, and the donation basket, I think, will be by uh, the, the exit uh, in the door back there. So um, that's all the announcements we have. Prayers will be coming pretty soon. If you could all stand uh, and uh, join me in, in prayer, if you please bow your heads. Dear Jesus, in the process, our call committee has been deep in thought and prayer. We've been asking for the Lord's guidance and discernment for us to identify who you, the Lord, have called to be our next pastor as our beloved pastor Bill retires. The Lord has been faithful. The Holy Spirit was with us, the call committee, as we interviewed, and he identified Pastor Mark to be called to LACF. All of us on the committee, the board of directors and the congregation, we're unanimous in our discernment and recognition of your will and your choice, Lord. And dear Lord, you are gracious and merciful. Your will is always for our love and benefit. In Jesus, we pray. Good and gracious God, we ask that your pathway and discernment becomes clear for Pastor Mark and Lynette. In Jesus we pray. We also pray for Pastor Mark and Lynette for the peace of God, even in times of turmoil. His peace, your peace, Lord, which passes all understanding. In Jesus we pray. We pray that Pastor Mark and Lynette would walk confidently in the direction that you have planned for their lives. God's peace is in God's will. His will be done. In Jesus we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.
your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Yeah. 
Please be seated. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Let us confess our sin to God, our merciful Father. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. God is rich in mercy, slow to anger, and abounding in love. And for the sake of the suffering and the death of his beloved son, I announce he forgives us all our sins in the name of the Father, in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the air I breathe. 
Join me in prayer. We pray that our Father would minister to the needs of those suffering emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And we hold Paula Ballard, Sue Bujak, David Davis, Bruce and Kim Dupree, Connie Groth, Tracy Hassenhorn, Mary Hensler, Larry Johnston, Dylan Oshansky, Donna and Chris Riemenschneider, Judy Rhodes, Marlene Rosine, Sharon Wine, and Barb Roth. In fact, Barb's in hospital, so we want to say a prayer for her. Um, she was taken this week. Um, probably middle of the week she'll be back. That our Father would bless the ministry of Donita Carlson and Love, Inc. That our Father would bless the ministry of John Peter and in India Transformed. That our Father would strengthen new Christians in Vietnam who've been rejected by their families and communities. And that our Father would watch over our military men and women, especially Christopher Curran, Justin Heyman, Gary Pietzmeyer, Jessica Pizer, Josh Riemenschneider, Emily Termat, Trent Winters, and of course our police and firefighters. Keep them safe and fill their hearts with his peace. That our Father would watch over our flock, many who are still isolated in their homes. That our Father would lead our loved ones who do not know Jesus to turn to him in faith and receive his love. That our Father would lead all churches to preach his true word to a world that is starving for the truth. In his name. Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Also join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand. Today's scripture is Psalm 40, 1 to 5, and it's from the director of music of David, a psalm. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth and a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you plan for us no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, there would be too many to declare.
Say that again. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Jody didn't have to, have to hit me with the flashing light, so that's all good, right? Um, before I start, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. I do not spring ahead very well. Okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't. And this is the deal. If you forgive me for s sitting up here and just kind of like staring off and spacing out, I'll forgive you if you fall asleep during my message. Is that fair? All right, cool. Um, let me take So, storms. The last time I was here was a little over a year ago. You had just opened this place up. It was brand I don't even know if it was a month old when I was here. But a lot has happened <laughs> since then. Um, some good things, some bad things. Certainly COVID, I can't wait to put it behind me. But in that six, six months ago, I became a grandpa for the first time. So that's kind of cool. Got, you know, and a lot of good things have happened. But storms. Um, the storms of life. The Bible talks about storms. The Bible mentions quite a few storms, actually. And I settled on five. Five storms that happen in the Bible. I want to start, though, uh, with this Psalm 40, verse, verses, just verses 1 and 2. It talks about the muck and the mire, or the mud and the mire, and putting me on the solid rock. And I thought... I really don't, I mean, I kind of comprehend what Meyer is, but I looked it up. I actually looked up the definition. And this is kind of, one of the definitions for Meyer, and this kind of pertains to us today, is a situation or a state of difficulty from which it is difficult to extricate one's self. And I thought, wow, yep, we've, we've been going through this. We can't get out of this. One thing that I've noticed in my life since COVID hit, I am getting closer and closer and closer to God every single day. This last year, January 1, I started something I've never done in my life. And I've always thought it was cool. I always liked the idea of journaling. But not for me. Until now. I started journaling January 1, and that's where this message came from. My journals. Part of it. So, anyways, the five storms that are in the Bible. Now, the very first storm that I'm going to talk about is found in Genesis. Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 through 14. The great flood. Now, I don't know if there was a lot of wind or a lot of whatever to qualify this as a storm, but in my book, if it rains for 40 days and 40 nights, that's a storm. That's, that's, <laughs> that's going to get your attention. And I thought about this, and well, here, let, let, let me read. Um, chapter 6, 9. We'll start at verse 9 through 14. It says, This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, ja and Japheth. The earth, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, and make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside with pitch. When I read this, I thought, kind of describes our world today, doesn't it? 
Noah, one thing about him, it says, it says here that he walked with God. Noah did not have a Bible to read. Not even the Old Testament. Okay, this is Genesis. Moses isn't even along yet to write the first five books of the Bible. He's not even around. So Noah walked with God daily. And Noah, when God told him to build that ark, I mean, it's like it had never, first of all, it's going to rain. It had never rained before. The earth at this time was totally irrigated through springs, through dew, but not rain. It had never rained yet. And now it's going to rain. And it's going to rain so much that you're going to need a big boat to survive. And Noah started building. He was obedient. See, some of the storms that we face, we, have to pre- we can prepare for them. We never see the storms coming. We never know exactly what's going to happen. But we can prepare for storms by trusting God. By listening. And when He says to do something, you do it. I don't know. They estimate that it took the Noah over a hundred or more years to build this ark. And it's huge. I, there's this place, I think it's in Kentucky, where they've got the ark. And I want to go visit that. Hopefully I can... <laughs> put that on my bucket list and check that off sometime soon. You know, and, and it's just amazing when you think of it. Now, I can't imagine, I can imagine the ridicule that Noah got from the other people. And that it was, what are you doing? It, what, I'm building a boat, it's going to rain. <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, the thing is, He didn't let the ridicule stop him from obeying God. He didn't quit. He kept building. And then then it happened. Now, it says, Then the Lord, uh, chapter 7, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You see, Noah, he was righteous in front of the people that he was hanging around with. We are called to do the same. We are called to be righteous in a world that's, well, not so good. That's violent. That's immoral. That's all of it. We are called to be righteous. We don't go along with the jokes. We don't go along with with what they're doing. We're different. We're called to be different. One thought I had just this last week on this as I was going over this again. And I thought, you know, I wonder if Noah had any friends that he couldn't let into that boat. And I thought, I don't know. But then I thought of his sons and Noah's wife. Man, they had to have had in-laws that they loved and cared about, even though they weren't following. And I'm so pleased, and I'm so happy, and I'm so thankful to God that today, right now, it's different. It is totally different for us. Heaven is wide open. We can take as many people as we can, you know, introduce to Jesus Christ. I was telling somebody, Shirley, I think, today, about how my wife introduced me to Christ in 1978. Those of you, Len, Pastor Buckman, Wednesday night, third date she took me to church. How many of you ladies took your husband to church on your third date? I didn't think so. (laughs) She did. She did. And my life was changed forever. It's amazing. She was willing to walk away from me. She was. But God 
you know, gave me a call that night, and I answered. I said, I want what these people have. And that's what you, got, that's what you want to be. You want to be something, someone, that people want to be like you. You want to be different. Totally different. So that people want what you have. Not a bad way to be. Second storm. Another familiar story in the Bible. Jonah. Now Jonah was a prophet. He covered the northernmost district of Israel. Okay? And Jonah, Jonah, he, his verses are, uh, okay, I'm going to go verse 1 through 4. And start there. Uh, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amate, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So, ah, I have to continue. But the Lord sent out a great wind out on the, on, on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Now, Jonah was told to do something. Just go to Tarshish and tell him to repent. Jonah didn't want to do that. Tarsh, or not Tarshish, Nineveh. Nineveh. Nineveh is in Assyria. Assyria was the enemies of Israel. Why do you want me to go here? They're, you know, they're not our friends. So Jonah, in his wisdom, thinks, well, I'm, I'm leaving. I am going to go far, far away from God. You can't do that, first of all. The farther you run, you know, God, can, God knows where you are. So, it picks up in verse 10. It says, so we've, we've got this storm going on. It says, Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more temptuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great, that this great tempest is because of me. Now, sometimes... we bring the storms on ourselves. Okay? Sometimes our storms are our own fault. Sometimes they're the fault of just the world in general. I believe in the time of Noah, it was the world in general. In the time of Jonah, this was just him. God told him what to do. He didn't do it. And it's not that Jonah was doing anything inherently bad. You know, he just wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. And so many times that gets us into more trouble than, than doing the bad things. So, Jonah basically decides to put himself right in the hands of a very angry God. God's mad at him. God has been mad at me in the past. God has been mad at me for, you know, not doing what he told me to do. And usually I figure it out <laughs> before he, you know, tells me, to, I'm throwing you overboard. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm done with you. I can't, you know, this is, this is what get, got me thinking on this one, though, is Jonah's faith. He had to have some extreme faith that even though I'm going overboard and I'm going in the ocean and I'm out in the middle of this, 
God's going to take care of me. God is going to take care of me. And, and so he goes in. And then from the belly of the whale, well, the Bible says great fish, but I've always heard it as a whale. So Anyway, whale, whale, great fish. It says, chapter 2, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the, the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, hell, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and all your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. I will turn my face back to you, God. Even though I've messed up, I am repenting right now from inside this fish, from inside this impossible situation. I'm looking to you, God. Because his situation was impossible. I will... The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit. O Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out onto dry land. Now, I don't know what you would look like after you've been in the belly of a fish for three days. <sighs> Probably not too good. You might be bleached white because, you know, really, you know, you might have seaweed hanging off your teeth. Who knows? <laughs> but it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be pretty. And then you go up to Nineveh looking like this and, and you say repent, you better believe they repented. <laughs> Anyways... All right, that's enough. I'm digressing on that story. Moving on to the New Testament. The next three stories, the next three storms involve Jesus. Okay? Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they, and, and they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down to the lake and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging water, and they ceased, and there was calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Now, there have been times in my life where I think Jesus is sleeping. But you know, even when I don't see him working, he's on the job. He knows. He knows everything we're going through. He's been through it himself. He knows everything that, um, that a possible outcome could be of every situation imaginable. He's that, he's that good. He's that powerful. He's that all-knowing. 
Um, it's not that Jesus wasn't with them. It's that they didn't quite understand. You know, what did he tell them in the, in the earlier verses? It said, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. He told them, we're going now. Doesn't mean there's not going to be storms along the way. But if God tells you that you're going to get through something, you're going to get through it. Now, in, in the, you know, even though I, in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for, that, for thou art with me. That is the ultimate storm. And Jesus faced that one too. I don't know. But I'm looking at this last year. I, well, last week I was listening to a guy on, on, on the radio and he talked about being homesick. And I thought to myself, and the way he described it, he said, you know, he said, I've been reading about this Jesus my entire life. I've been reading about heaven my entire life. I want to go. I want to go. Now, I, I, I've been kind of echoing these same words. I, I, you know, I, I kept telling people, you know, I'm, I'm kind of ready to... Any time. And I'm in pretty good health for my age, you know. But I'm ready. Now, I'm not rushing it. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to go out and do stupid things and, you know, that, you know, put me in danger or anything like that. I'm not going to do that. But I'm ready for that storm. Because I've been like Noah. I've been preparing for that storm. Right now, you guys are preparing for that storm. Being here. Right now, today. You're preparing for that storm. And it's a, good, it's a good place to be. Every time you trust God, every time you put your faith in Him and He sees you through, He's preparing you for that storm. Every time. So, it gets down to the end of this one. And in verse 25, it says, And they were afraid and marveled. See, this is, the first, this is the first step. I mean, the storm has been calmed. Now, now they're afraid of, who is this guy? That he tells the storm and the seas to be calm, and it happens. That's powerful. That is extremely powerful. They're questioning. And then it says, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and they obey him. Who can this man be? Well, let's get the answer to that one. Next one. Next storm. Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Immediately. Okay, now this is, this is right after Jesus fed the 5,000. This takes place immediately. And it says, it says immediately... Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. So he tells them, okay, you guys go, I'll catch up. Okay? Go to, the, and go to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Jesus took time to pray. Don't ever underestimate the need to pray went up on the mountain himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Well, you know, how, so they're, they're struggling. Now, it was in the fourth watch. The fourth watch, I'm told, is, you know, is between uh, three and six in the morning. So Jesus was praying, you know, Three o'clock in the morning. Um, now it was in the fourth watch of the night. Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. You know, 
And But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. You know, Jesus sees our trouble. And sometimes we have to go through a little bit of it. But at just the right moment, He comes. Even if it's 4 o'clock in the morning, He comes. And He says, be of good, don't, don't be afraid, it's me. It's me. You can trust me. You know. And he says, trust me. Trust me. So, and Peter, and it says, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Now, that's the bullet prayer, you know. I mean, Jesus, you know. And I've cried that one out several times. Maybe, well, maybe more than several. I don't know. God, help me. Help me right now. I need your help. And he does. He reaches out his hand, and he, and he, and he, he says, I'm with you. I'm with you. Trust me. Now, Peter's fault was he started looking at what was going on in the oceans or on the, on the sea. He was looking at the waves. He was, looking, he was feeling the wind in his face. He was hearing the roar. Maybe there was thunder. And it's like, uh, I'm, I can't do this. And he sinks. And so he, went, he goes down. But it goes on. He goes on. It says, and immediately stretched out his hand and called to him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith. Hmm. That can be me from time to time, little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Well, Jesus, he didn't even say anything now. He just stepped into the boat and got calm. Then those who were with him in the boat now, they're not questioning who he is and they're not afraid of him. It says, Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now they get it. You know, and the disciples, you know, this, this goes on. And, and we know the story. You know, we've got the benefit of the story. These guys were living the story. They couldn't write, they couldn't read it. But we know the story. The disciples, they still, they don't get it straight all the time. And so, you know, their, 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 their faith goes up and down. Peter especially, you know, he's, oh, I'll never deny you. Yeah, well, you did. <laughs> you know, so it goes on. Now, my sixth and final storm. Jesus at the cross. It says, uh, this is Matthew 27, verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Now here again, it's your definition of storm. To me, an earthquake is, I don't know if you'd call it a storm, but it's a natural disaster. But yet the way was made open that veil torn from top to bottom. But what about the storm prior to this moment that Jesus went through? First off, he's arrested. He's with his disciples. It's Thursday night. They go to the garden to pray. And he's in deep anguish. And they can't, they can't hang with him. You know, can't you pray with me one hour? You know, he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You've got, you know, stick with him. Then, he's betrayed by one of his twelve, by one of his closest men. He's betrayed, and not with, hey, that's the guy. No, it's the guy I walk up to and give, and give a kiss to, and give a greeting to. That's, that'll be the guy. Okay? So, now he's betrayed. 
And then he's hauled off, and then he's accused. And they're lying about him. They are giving false testimony. They can't agree. You know. And Jesus says absolutely nothing about the lies that are you know, thrown at him. What he does admit to, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? Yes, I am. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. He goes off again. Now they take him to Pilate because they can't kill him because the Romans wouldn't stand for that. But Pilate can have the, has the authority to have him put to death. Pilate says, are you the king? Yes, I'm a king. My kingdom is not of this earth, though. My kingdom is of heaven. That's, that's what Jesus admits to. The truth. They mock him. The soldiers mock him. The soldiers put a purple robe on him, a crown of thorns. They bow before him. You know, and they, and they say, hey, you know, um, hail the king. And even as he's, you know, and after they, they whip him to within an inch of his death, they finally crucify him. And even there, they mock him. They say things like, hey, he, he said he's going to, you know, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? can't save himself because he needed to die to save us that's why he didn't save himself because he knows what we needed he knows exactly what we needed you know the two thieves on the on, on the cross one said Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today. Now, Jesus knew that guy was going to die, just like he was going to die. But today you'll be with me in paradise. Getting back to that final storm that we have to face. On that day you'll be in paradise. On that day. Now, I said... Um, I gotta get. Oh boy. Hold it. I know what I'll do because it was here. I don't need my phone this time. It says, He lifted, uh, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the muck and mire and set my feet on a rock. This muck and mire that we call sin. Remember I said the definition of mire was um, a difficulty from which it is difficult to extricate oneself. This muck and this mire that we call sin. The only way we can get out of it is with Jesus. Jesus. That is the only way. There is no other. But this is what will happen. Jesus will pull us out of the mire because he is the rock. And he gives us strength. Thank you.
Reminder, next week, uh, Pastor Mark and Lynette Schultz will be here uh, joining us for services and Q&A to follow. I want to thank our uh, servers today, Pat Roshesky, Bethlehem, our worship team, Amy Hammond and Mark Mayhe, our usher, Norm Obler. Next week will be Len, Len uh, Ballard, our greeters, Donna Winters and Donna Riemann Schneider. On the soundboard and the flashlight, in case I forget anything, is Jody Hammond and uh, Eric Scheisser. And now the closing blessing. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.